Hello, everyone. I am so thrilled to be back here for Torah in Motion to give this four-part series of Shirim um, on the origins of the Oral Torah. And thank you so much, Shira, for the introduction. Um, so what I'm going to do is periodically throughout the Shir, I will pause to address questions in the chat. And also then at that point, if people want to speak up and raise questions, um, they may do so. I am also OK with being interrupted as needed. If people have questions that need, you know, they feel they need to be addressed for clarity as, as we go on. Um, this topic is something that I've been thinking about for for quite a while. And um, actually, um, some of you may have seen that um, this podcast, the 1840 podcast, which maybe some of you listen to, it's a, a fairly popular uh, podcast of Jewish community and Orthodox Jewish ideas. Um, these days, they did. Um, a series on related to this topic, and I contributed um, a series of articles um, on the topic for the to accompany the podcast on their website. And so these shiurim are kind of based on those articles. Um, so maybe it's uh, maybe at the end I'll I'll just I'll put in the chat like a link um, to those articles. So if you want to look at those, also also you 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 could do that. Um, let me begin by talking about um, Rabbi. Adin Steinsaltz, actually, um, just for a moment. He was one of the towering Torah personalities of our times. He was really, really good at explaining really complicated Jewish ideas in a very simple way. Um, but it's interesting because sometimes, um, because of what he said, he did not always meet with universal approval. Um, for example, um, in, uh, in 1984, he wrote a book called Dimuyot Bamikra, or in English, it was translated as Biblical Images. And it looks at various figures in Tanakh. Um, and one of the things that it does that some people were unhappy with is he doesn't cover up their imperfections. If he feels like that, you know, Avram Avinu did something wrong, or Yaakov, he calls it out. He says, um, the Bible does not seek to cover up imperfections. It tells the truth, even though it may be unpleasant. Um, there were certain people in the community who felt that this was inappropriate. And in fact, in 1989, a number of uh, Haredi rabbis in Israel actually uh, uh, ban ban banned his books, that one and, and other books. Um, this controversy then spilled over into other areas. So in 1990, in the Jewish Observer, which was an organ of Agudas Yisrael, a magazine in English for a while, a Rabbi Joseph Elias, who was an important member, a distinguished member of the German Jewish community in Washington Heights, he also took issue with Rabbi Steinsaltz, not just for his views on biblical figures and their possible imperfections, but also his views on the oral Torah, or as we know as the Torah Shabbat al -Peh. And without getting into a great deal of specifics, um, he felt that there were passages where Rabbi Steinzals implied, or even said outright, that the oral Torah evolved over time, as opposed to being given directly at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, um, to Moshe Rabbeinu. So let me uh, share with you my screen actually at this point, and you can we'll look, we'll look at the source together. Actually, let me make this even uh, larger, I guess. Uh, see. Okay, I think that's about as large as we can make it. Um, so if you look over here at source number one, here is the article from Rabbi Joseph Elias, and this is what he says. The inseparable oneness of the written law and the oral law, given at the same time at Sinai, is the indisputable foundation of Torah Judaism. In fact, our sages stress that God only concluded his covenant with Israel on the basis of the oral law, and that the denial of the divinity of the Torah on account of which a person loses his share in the world to come, includes the denial of even one kavachom or gezerah shava, both expressions of the oral law, while the actual kavachom may have been enunciated by a Talmudic sage, and produce um, the, me the method was taught at Sinai and produced conclusions already part of the Sinai le le legislation. He says in the second paragraph, which is really the important part actually, what was given at Sinai was a complete, specific and binding oral law code explaining in full and beyond possibility of misunderstandings the teachings of the written law. In the course of the generations, much was added to this law code, further clarifications in response to new circumstances or to misunderstandings that arose based on the rules of interpretation given at Sinai and rabbinic elaborations and ordinances clearly labeled as such. But this is certain. The oral law was not a set of, set of vague traditions from ancient times that slowly evolved into the law that we know. So. What Rabbi Elias here is saying 
is that um, fundamental to our belief as Torah Jews is that there are two Torahs. I think this is this is this is fairly basic. Um, one Torah Shabalpa and one Torah Shabiksaf, one oral Torah and written Torah, both given at Sinai, both essential are to performance of mitzvot. Um, but the question is though, and, and, and we, know, we know that it, we call it the oral Torah, but of course it was, as we know, it was eventually committed to writing in, in the works like, you know, the Mishnah and the Gemara and beyond and beyond and beyond and so forth. Um, but, the, but what Rabbi Elias is saying, even though it's true that, you know, it was started out as oral and was written down and all that, um, it, it, it really does not change. There are sort of things that come into being over time. Like for example, you know, electricity didn't exist in the time of the sages. So how do we deal with electricity from a Torah perspective? So the rabbis have to look at the sources that pre-existing sources and adapt them and figure out how we fit electricity into pre-existing formulations. Um, but, 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 but he would say though that, you know, this is not like an evolution as of sort. The, the laws and the principles were all present there at Sinai to begin with. Um, and what was added in a certain sense was of, of a lower level, of a lower status, sort of a more minor kind of gradual process of sort of fine tuning, but not something as broad as what we might call like an evolution um, or, 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 or a change, um, but really that the, everything, everything was passed down. Um, I think one basic question always that arises when you read things like this is what do you do with the fact that like from the earliest stages of Torah Shabbal Peh, of the oral Torah, there are debates. There, the rabbis in the Mishnah, it, it, you almost, almost, it's almost like the Mishnah is almost like less of a law code, even if you look at the Mishnah, than sort of a record of people arguing with each other. You have, because the sages say one thing, Rabbi Yehuda says something else, and this is, you know, on every page of the Gemara as well. It's just uh, debate after dispute after dispute. Um, so, so what's going on there? Um, if everything was passed down, why, why is there so much dispute? And this is something we're going to have to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to have to explore. Um, um, and then the fact also that just there's just so many books, like there's just there's so many halachas farm in every generation. There's new stuff, and this gets added to that, gets added to that, um, and 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 it, and it seems like the you know there there are new things that seem to be introduced from time to time, and it doesn't just seem like you know everything was sort of passed down in a straight line. There seems to be a lot of you know stops and starts and and, and thing and things that get added to that. Um, so, so, so we have to figure out sort of what that is as well. And, and there are also historical questions. Um, I, I mean, you know, some of the most difficult historical questions have to do with when we compare Tanakh to then our halachic system. Like it doesn't really seem in Tanakh that there's such a developed and strong halachic system like we have today. We don't see people so concerned with details. Um, I mean, the prophets all the time complain about people not observing the Torah properly, but they never like say like, you know, they might say in a very general way, like keep the Shabbos, but they're never really calling out specific malachos or specific things that we consider part of keeping Shabbos today. Um, they're not giving specifics of kashrut or an, anything of that sort. And we don't see people learning Torah very much in Tanakh either. Um, there's, there's no like, you know, you aren't really yeshivos in the same way. And to, to you know, to, to the rabbis later and today also one of the sort of the sine qua non of of uh, Torah Judaism, part of it is is sitting and learning Torah, and you don't really see that from an early time. Um, also, um, I mean, some of you are probably familiar as well with modern academic scholarship to a certain degree, and modern academic scholars will tell you, well, the Torah Shabbat has um, the idea that there's this other Torah given at Sinai. Well, we don't have any evidence for that. There's no, you can't, you can't prove that something like that that existed. I mean, the first records we really have are the Mishnah itself of the rabbi saying like, you know, this thing was passed down, but like, we can't trace that. Um, we can't trace that. Um, and um, so, 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 you know, so like there, there are these questions that arise and I wanna just concretize this a little bit in source, num in source number two over here. I think this is, is a good example. Um, this is from Sefer Nehemia. Um, and the context here is that Ezra is, is bringing the, the Jewish people on. Ezra and Zerubbabel are bringing the Jewish people back to the land of Israel after the Babylonian exile. And there's a kind of a religious revival going on and they're reading the Torah and they're discovering things that they had not been keeping in exile and, and trying to figure out how to do them. So one of the things that they find is to celebrate Sukkot. 
here in, in source number two. So how do they celebrate Sukkot? If we look at if you look at the second pasuk here, Vasher Yishmu Biyavu Kol B'Chal Arhem Bushalayim Leimor. They say uh, they they're told to go out to the to Jerusalem to their cities um, and to say um, and to tell people to do this. Vehavu Suuha Har go out to the mountain. Vehavu Ale Zayis Vale Shemen Vale Hadas Vale Tamarim Vale Avos Lasos Sukos Kakasuf. So what are they told to do? Let's look at what the English says because that would be a more precise translation. Um, and they must go out and announce and proclaim throughout all their towns in Jerusalem as follows. Go out to the mountains and bring leafy branches of olive trees, pine trees, myrtles, palms, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. So they're going out and bringing these things and they're using them to make Sukkot. So, and maybe if someone wants to jump in here, actually, what, what's really interesting sort of about this list of things they're using to make the sukkah? The arba minim that we yeah. wave around. Right. So we wave the arba minim around, but it seems over here that they're actually going and using the arba minim, or at least some of them, to build a sukkah, which is which is really fascinating. Like if you look down in source number, um, in, in in source number three here, um, we uh, we we have the pasuk in Vayikra. Um, it says ulakachtem lachem biyamarishon. Um, on the first day, you should take the beautiful tree fruit. You know, all, all these things that we, that we use as the Arba Minim. And it doesn't exactly say what to do with them, um, which is you should have a choice. Um, the way we've typically understood this, um, you know, according to the Torah, Shabbat Peh, according to the Oral Torah, is you're, you're waving them during Halal, you're saying the bracha on them. But it seems in the time of Ezra, what they were doing is they were actually using them to build Sukkot. And this sort of sort of sharpens, I think, our question about the origins of the oral Torah. Because, because I mean, no, 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 number one, it seems like there wasn't, I mean, it basically just seems that, that, uh, that there, there wasn't this tradition may not have existed yet about how to use them. Um, and that it meant something else at, at, the, at the time. Um, so, so you'll sort of, so you, so, you, so you can see there here that, that there seems to be some kind of disconnect that we need to explore between tradition um, and, 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 and between what we do now um, and, and how this all came to be. Um, so what we're going to do in the rest of this class, at least, is we'll look at varying opinions among the Talmudic sages about what was given at Har Sinai exactly and, what we can, and also what we can glean from how they use Midrash to derive halacha. Then in the second class, what I'd like to do is talk about a debate between the Gaonim, um, so early early rabbinic thinkers, and the Rishonim, slightly later rabbinic thinkers, about whether or not the sages cre um, created new law um, and, and how we understand dispute in halacha. Class number three, I'll look at various challenges posed by the reform movement in the 19th century to the antiquity of the oral Torah and how various rabbis at the time responded to their challenges. Um, particularly when it comes to how we use exegetical principles to darshan or learn out new things from the Torah. And in class number four, I want to come back to sort of the issue we've sort of raised right now um, at, at the very end, um, just from this Pasuk and Nehemia, but more broadly as well, about the disconnect between biblical and rabbinic times. And we'll present some interesting views um, of early 20th century thinkers about the development of the oral Torah. So that's like a broad overview. Of, of 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 what of what we are going to do um, in these classes, and before I turn to the direct uh, material about what Chazal or what the sages say themselves about the nature and status of the oral Torah, let me first look at the chat and address that, and then I'll open up the floor for some 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 questions as well. So I'm just looking at the chat right now. Ariel Siegel tells us about digitization at the Library of Congress and provides a link for that. Thank you, Ariel. Um, there's a comment here from Janine about um, the ongoing refinement of secular law um, that are based historically on ancient oral law. I mean, sure, there, there's definitely a lot of um, discussion as well about, about how secular law came to be and the customs that and, and it can shape institutions. Uh, certainly. 
Dennis says a four-step process from Sinai, received, derived, legislated, and customary. The eternal renewed and the new sanctified. So Dennis seems to be referring to that there are multiple ways, perhaps, that, thing, that things came from Sinai. Uh, and we're going to discuss some of these things um, for sure. Um, he mentions, for example, legislation. I assume he's referring to rabbinic legislation. Yeah, that's an important component, too. There are certainly things that I think everyone would agree that the rabbis instituted, um, and those are specifically called out as gezerot or tekanot, things that the rabbis instituted. Um, okay, and here's a comment about Sfirat HaOmer. Um, yeah, does anyone have any, any further questions they want to share before I go on? Okay, let me, let me continue then. Um, so here's part two on the source sheet. You can see, what did the sages think was given at Sinai? That's what we're going to look at first. So in source number four in the Gemara and Brachot, what I'm going to call this the maximalist view. Um, and we see over here, um, they, basically the Gemara is going to quote a Pasuk and then explain what it means. So Amr Rabbi Levi Bar Chama, Amr Rabbi Shimon Ben Lakish. Um, Rabbi Levi Bar Chama said in the name of Shimon Ben Lakish, um, my dixiv, what does it mean when it says that now the cha et luchot ha evan va torah va mitzvah asher kasapti lahorosam? What is the meaning of that which is written? Ascend to the mountain and be there, and I will give you the stone tablets and the Torah and the mitzvah that I have written that you that 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 you may teach them. Um, so so the Gemara is going to try to figure out what each of these different words means. Um, Luchot. When it says Luchot, what does that mean? Elo aseret hadibro. These are the Ten Commandments. Torah. What does it mean when it says Torah in the pasuk? Zem mikra. This is what we call the, the, the Torah Shabbik Sab, the five books of Moses. The mitzvah, what's mitzvah in the Pasuk? The Mishnah. Asher Kasavti, that I wrote, Elu Nevim Uksuvim. These are the prophets and the writings. The Horosam, that you may teach them, Zet Talmud. This refers to the Talmud or the Gemara. Malamed Shekulam Nitnu Lemoshe Misinai. This is to teach us that all of these things were given to Moshe at Sinai. So this Gemara takes a very broad view that the Mishnah itself and the Gemara texts that, as we have them today at least, that were clearly written at a later period, are themselves in some way already given at Sinai. Now, we have to figure out exactly what this means. Um, so it, it seems like at the very least, the Gemara is linking um, all these later rabbinic texts in a very strong way to Sinai. So is it meant to be taken literally? Or could it be the Gemara is taking a bit of poetic license and perhaps it's stressing that every bit of the oral Torah is imbued with Sinaitic, um, um, imbued with sort of a Sinaitic authority, even if it is composed later. But anyway, it's a very strong statement, though, about the antiquity of the oral Torah, at the very least. Source number five, we see something that in some ways is similar, but is possibly a little less strong. Um, the Amar, Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. My dixiv, we have another uh, pasuk that it's gonna, we're going to quote here and explore. Va'aleim k'chol hadvarim asher diber Hashem imachem bahar. Um, so that if you look at the English here, it says, and the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. That's an introduction to the pasuk. Then the Gemara quotes the next part. The Gemara quotes the part that says, and on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spoke with you in the mountain. Um, so what, and now what the Gemara is going to do is sort of look at extra phrases or extra, extra letters, sorry, in, in, in this part of the Pasuk and try to see what these extra letters teach us. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it seem, it's, it seems like it's, it's focusing on the fact that it says va'alehem and on them, like all the, the things. So we have some extra letters that we have above, um, to, it says va before alehem. Achaf before kich before kol and it's devarim these things says a hey so the gemara often likes to sort of notice these slightly extraneous letters and try to figure out what they mean so we have a few extraneous letters over here and so what is it teaching us malamet she'ar era kodesh baruch hu lemoshe dikduke torah dikdufe sofrim umasha sofrim asid in the this teaches us that Hashem sot Moshe all the inferences that can be derived from the words of the Torah and all the inferences that can be derived from the words of the scribes and also all that the scribes were destined to introduce. So can someone tell me maybe what about 
this Gemara seems very similar to the previous one. So everything was given at once, even things that are, go are going to happen in the future. Right. It seems to be saying also this very kind of maximalist view that when the Torah was given in Har Sinai, uh, there was also a Torah Shabbal Peh that was given. And this Torah Shabbal Peh even includes later developments. Now, the question is maybe, again, let's try to think of as another way to understand this Gemara. And I think Excuse this me. is... Excuse wait. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. That last... Uh thing it didn't say that that was given it said that Hashem showed it to Moshe ah right exactly it says that Hashem showed it to Moshe so let's look at source number six here this is the Tosfot Yom Tov who's a 17th century commentator um and 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 he basically says this when he explains this Gemara if you just look at the bolded part of what he says so he says Shani Omer Moser Moshe Lacherim Klal then when it's talking about that all these things that the scribes are destined to, to produce, Moshe didn't transmit them to anyone. And that's exactly what it says. Actually, says, It says that he showed him, not that he gave it over. It doesn't say that he taught them, doesn't say that he gave them over. It says he showed them. This is just seeing. Not giving over. It's like someone who shows his friend something but doesn't give it to him. Yeah, that that would uh, obviate the problem of not being given, given in a foreknowledge of everything that's going to happen in the next thousand, thousand years. Sure. Can you just sharpen that a little bit, Ariel? I don't. I'm not sure I mean, like, I, and not, if not, not were given. Then you know, if people knew everything that was going to happen, ah, that right. that would cause a, a lot of contradictions of free will and historicity itself. But right. uh, in so some we, broader typological, metaphysical sense, that that uh, reduces the tension. Right. So I, I, I was referring to the Gemara in, in Brachot that we saw before that said that even Nevi'im, the sort of the events of the Nevi'im. Um, what happened in the days of the prophets was already shown, given to Moshe at Har Sinai. But we can sort of use what the Tosos Yom Tov says to explain that as well, that maybe Moshe was given some kind of preview of some prophetic foreknowledge, but not that this was actually, he actually transmitted this to the people because that would indeed contradict free, free will. Thank you for that, Ariel. So, so are, are, are we seeing a tension between what is given, what is understood, and then when it is applied? and interpret it. Okay, sure. Do you want to say more about that? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think it's uh, clearly we're seeing it, it's a stage process. Everything is given, mm -hmm. but it's, a t it's above time and space. And therefore, the above time and space must be brought down to earth to sanctify it. And mm -hmm. it goes through a process of delineation. First, understanding it and absorbing it, then interpreting it, then applying it, and then coming to conclusion. Sure. And I'm hearing echoes of, in what you're saying, of some ideas we're going to explore later in the series, actually, about what, you know, how do we understand this idea that, like, something was given, but it's not something that we can really use at the time it was given? Um, like, like, what, like, was, is something maybe latent in the written Torah that only gets revealed later? Or something that you know, you know, or almost in a more metaphysical or even mystical way, there, there's something there, but it, it's it's not something that that you know is is complete is completely is completely brought out until it's interpreted later by the rabbis. And we're going to get to views, um, particularly toward the end, that 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 say things like that um, as well. Yeah. Um, How if you if you go back I gave everything almost everything in Bamidbar and and uh, and the volume. Everything happened after China. Mm -hmm. So could I have been given that and big
right? So I, I think you're referring to the fact that like we have the event at Har Sinai, we call the giving of the Torah in Sefer Shemos. And then, but there's a lot more of the Torah after that. There's others farm, there's Ba Midbar and Dvar. I mean, Vayikra, I think a lot of it is like, it says in Vayikra that it's given, a lot of those laws were given at Sinai as well. But we get to a Bamidbar and Devarim and they're traveling further to the land and there's additional stories and there's additional, law, additional laws given. So certainly, yeah, I, I think on a very basic level, when we talk about things being given at Sinai, we don't always mean that, you know, they were actually all literally handed down on that mountain, that there was indeed even further development in, uh, in, 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 the, in the desert itself. Uh, and, and there's discussions in the Talmud and other places about this and, and, and how it was given. There's question of whether was the Torah, was the Torah given sort of all at once at the end, like, you know, the, the five books of Moshe, are they all like put together at the very end of their time in the desert before going into the land? Um, or was 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 it given kind of scroll by scroll, like along the way, as things happened, it was written down and put together. So the, those, are, those are all sort of questions that are related <clears throat> to the story. They're, they're not exactly sort of the, the story we're talking about, about how the oral Torah evolved. But yeah, certainly there are, there are questions as well. Um, and discussions about how the written Torah came to be and exactly how it was put together. Um, how do we line up the language of Harehu with mm -hmm. the story of Moshe being showed Rabbi Akiva, Darshaning Tagim, and the base Midrash? Great question. We are going to get to that story uh, momentarily. Um, and, we, and we can discuss that, that point when, when we get there. Um, before we get to that story, though, I want to do a couple other sources. So in, in source number seven, um, this is a midrash, a Shemot Rabbah, um, which seems to present somewhat of a different, a different view um, than what we saw before. V'chi kol ha-Torah lamad Moshe, could Moshe have really learned the entire Torah? Because if Torah, it says, it says in Sefer Eov, arucha me'eretz mida or achava mineyam, its measure is longer than the land and wider than the sea. Arba'im yom lamda Moshe, could Moshe have really learned it all in 40 days? God taught him general principles. So this is sort of acknowledging the fact that there's just so much in the Torah Shabbat Um and, and, the, and there seems to also be a process as well of development, um, as, as we've discussed. So maybe God, what God gave to Moshe was just general principles, and these principles can then be applied. And this seems to hint to something we're going to discuss also later, that, that we have this idea of like exegetical principles. Or like, for example, you may be familiar with the 13 midot of Rabbi Yishmael, um, things like um, Kava Chomer, an a fortiori, or Gezerah Shava, something that, that compares two, word, two, of the, two of the same word in different contexts, and maybe learns one, uh, one thing from one word to the, and applies it to the other context. Various different principles we have to darshan or interpret the Torah. So maybe it was these general principles, or some, some similar types of principles, even if not exactly those principles that were taught at Sinai, and, and, then, and then they were applied elsewhere. Um, someone pointed out to me when I shared Shemot Rabbah before, and I think this is correct, but like Shemot Rabbah is actually, a, uh, in terms historically, it, it's a late source. It wasn't really compiled or put together into the 10th century. So we're already talking well into the medieval period, way after the time of Chazal that, that, that we generally talk about. So it could be, it's possible, it's reflecting also later uh, medieval ideas about the composition of the oral Torah that we're going to get to next time. But I, I think it's also, it, it does, I, I don't have it on the source sheet, but it, it does quote Rabbi Abahu um, in, in this context, who was who was an early, um, you know, who, who, who was someone from the, you know, the Amoraic period. So it may also be reflecting an authentic Amoraic statement. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of a little hard to know, but regardless, I wanted to bring it um, to your attention here. And then there's sort of another kind of uh, type of discussion that we often see in Chazal about the oral Torah, and that's this concept of lo bashamayim he, or that the Torah is not in heaven. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the story of Tanur Shalachnai, or the Oven of Achnai, and that's in Bava Metzia, and I didn't put it on the source sheet, um, but the basic idea is that there's this episode where the sages in Rabbi Eliezer are debating the ritual purity of an oven. And, and God actually even eventually announces the oven is pure after, after an extended back and forth where they're using miracles to prove, I mean, unless there's a, using miracles to prove his side, he's saying the oven is pure and he uses miracles um, to show that to show that he's correct. And God even comes down in a way, there's, a, there's something called a basco or a heavenly voice and says the oven is pure. But what do the sages do? They say, lo he, the Torah is not in heaven, basically contending God doesn't get a vote in this. And God seems to approve of this. He says, Nitzchuni banai, my children have triumphed over me. Um, 
Um, so we see this sort of idea that there is sort of a, an authority or an ability for the rabbis themselves to determine what the Torah means beyond even what what Hashem what 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 Hashem actually intended. Um, and I think that does kind of play in to this idea of the oral Torah and the development of the oral Torah and placing it um, out of God's hands. And I want to show you a couple other sources that relate to this too. Um, source number eight is a Gemara in Tamura. And it says, Shloshes alafim halachos nishtachu bimei avelo shal Moshe. 3,000 halachos were forgotten after Moshe died. Uh, when they were mourning for him. Amr lo Yoshua, the people said to Yoshua, who was then leading the people, Sha'al, why don't you just ask God? If we forgot these laws, let's ask God, because he's a prophet, and find out what to do. Amr le, lo he. It's not in heaven. And the Gemara continues with some additional discussions, then it picks up again. It says, Masni Sintana, we learned in Abraita, Elif Ushmameos, Kalin Vechamurum, Gezer, Shavas, Vigdute, Sofrim, Nishtaku bime Avelo Shamosha, 17,000 a fortiori inferences. Verbal analogies and minutiae of the scribes were forgotten during the morning period for Moshe. Amr Rabbi Yavahu, Rabbi Yavahu said, Afo Pikain, even so Hakziran, Adniel ben Kanaz, Mitoch Pilpulo. Um, Adniel, the son of Kanaz, who was one of the later um, judges, um, who in the rabbinic mind, he had some activity in, 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 in an earlier period as well, um, that he restored them through a sharp analysis. So we see in here, uh, you know, th this idea that even when things are forgotten, um, or, or, or um, that, that it's not really the place, our place after the Torah is given to go and use prophecy to restore those. This is something that's now handed over to human interpreters, to rabbis and scribes and, and others to, fi to figure out what to do. Um, so it seems that even if we're talking about, even if we sort of assume a kind of maximalist approach to what was given at Sinai, um, there then becomes a role still for the rabbis to interpret and to refine and to recall th things that are forgotten. And, and this is something we're going to see also throughout th throughout the series about, about this role of, um, of, of rabbis in potentially restoring things that were forgotten or expanding Torah through that process. Um, and then in source number nine, we get to the Gemara Menachot, which was, which was referenced earlier. And, and this is essentially a story where Moshe, Mo, Mo, Moshe, when Moshe goes up to Har Sinai to receive the Torah, he finds Hashem. What's Hashem doing? He's sitting and tying crowns to the letters of the Torah, and 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 Hashem says, uh, you know, why? Hashem basically, what are you doing? Why? Why are we waiting to give the Torah until you write these crowns? And Hashem says that eventually Rabbi Akiva is going to come many years, many generations later, and he's going to be able to to learn all sorts of new laws from these crowns. So we need we need to put the crowns um, on the Torah. So then um, so then I'll only let me pick up actually here in the middle of the source um, from the third to the bottom line in the middle of the line it says Amr Lafanup that Hashem says to Moshe Rabbanu Sholam God Hareyoli so show me Rabbi Akiva Amr Lo he says Chazor uh, LaHarecha um, look behind you Halach BiYashav B'Sei Shmona Shuros so when when um, when when uh, so Moshe um, sat um, eight rows back. And he didn't actually understand what was going on. He didn't understand what Rabbi Akiva was teaching. Tasha Koho, and he felt he felt weakened. But when they get to one thing in the Rabbi Akiva Shir, Amr Tamidav, his student said to him, Rabbi Minayim Lacha, our teacher, where do you know this from? Amr Lahem, he said back to them, Halacha Lamoshim Sinai. This is a this is a halacha transmitted from Moshe from Sinai. This Yashva Dati. So at that point, when Moshe heard that this halacha, um, what came from Sinai, his mind his mind was put at ease. Uh, and I think this is, this Gemara is so interesting on, on so many levels. Um, um, so I, I guess the, the, it's just interesting. We have sort of Moshe going to Rabbi Akiva Shir um, in, in, in the future, and he doesn't know something. And then when he hears that it was taught to Moshe at Sinai, he felt better. So I guess the question is, first of all, what does it even mean? That something came from Sinai, if he didn't know what I mean, it was, something was taught to him at Sinai, but he didn't even know what it was. It's a little bit of a strange paradox there. And also, why did that make him feel better? So we have to sort of think about this. So Rashi has an actually, in a way, a very simple way of explaining this Gemara. But I think there, are, as we're going to see, there are many other ways to interpret it as well. So if you look in source number ten here, Rashi says when it says Nisyash Vadato that Moshe felt better, um, it says he says Nisyash Vadato Shal Moshe. 
Moshe felt better. Why ho umishma omer? Because it was said in his name, his name Afopisha Dayan Lo Kibla, even though he had not yet received it. Someone want to jump here in here as well, maybe, and let me know what they think about how how is Rashi trying to resolve these problems? How is Rashi interpreting this this passage? A Torah Misinai is just a concept. It's an idea, not a practical event. Okay, that, that's an approach. I don't think that's what Rashi is saying. Uh, Rashi could be talking about this uh, opening the, the uh, ongoing revelation. Moshe hasn't said it yet, but he will say it in the course of, you know, the journey through the wilderness. Right. Okay. He's, he's going... uh, 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 yes. Uh, perhaps, a... perhaps um, Rashi is also suggesting that even one as great and the greatest human ever to be Moses cannot foresee and be above time and place to understand the law so that he too must be given help to appreciate its understanding on earth. Okay, I, I, again, that, that's that's interesting. That, that's a good point. I don't know what Rashi is saying. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I missed the... Uh... The person who, who was talking more about Moshe receiving in the desert later, I missed, I'm sorry, I missed your name uh, when, when you were speaking. But um, but but yeah, I, I think that's sort of on on the right track to what Rashi is saying. The, the focus here on, in in Rashi is Shah Dayan Lo Kibla. He had not yet received it, but this is something that he was going to receive. I think the way Rashi is saying this Gemara is in a very limited way. He's saying that 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 Moshe felt better because he realized. That even though he hadn't learned a lot of things yet, that there was going to be a lot more of a revelatory process throughout his own life, uh, maybe throughout later in the desert or later in Har Sinai. Um, but but he was going to learn these things eventually. He just hadn't gotten to it yet. Um, but I think in a way that's very limited because then we're not referring anymore to like things that were derived much later by sages. Um, we're we're really we're really focusing on things that occurred during Moshe's own lifetime. But I don't think that's the only way we can interpret this Gemara. I, I think we can also say that it's that that in a way it's saying that yes, there are many things that Moshe did not learn. There were many things in what we call the Torah Shabbal Peh that were not given at Sinai, but in many ways they can be traced back to Sinai. Even Rabbi Akiva's creativity stemmed perhaps from principles that Moshe had transmitted, um, and that Sinai is important in the halachic process, even though it moves on a lot from Sinai, um, and even though there's so many new things that are learned, they still have the authority of Sinai when that happens. And when late, late, later rabbis teach new laws and concepts, it's almost as if Moshe received and transmitted them. Um, do, and, you think, do you think that the Shmona Surat are the eight last verses of Dvarim? written after Moshe Rabbeinu was dead? That's really interesting. That's really an interesting approach. I had not thought of that, actually. Um, I had not thought of that. Um, yes, because you are referring to another Gemara elsewhere that talks about how, uh, at least according to one opinion, there were eight, eight verses of the Torah that talked about Moshe's death that were written after, after indeed Moshe died. Um, so that, that's interesting. That, I would they, think that that's a pshat. Otherwise, why would it be eight 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 rows? Why does the Agada mm -hmm. say eight rows? It makes no sense. It's mm -hmm. a reference to the eight verses. Well, In thank you for that. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Um, that's an that's that, yeah that's that's definitely an interest that's an interesting approach. Um, why not Why not take the simple uh, interpretation of this? Moshe Rabbeinu spends 40 days up on Har Sinai. Mm -hmm. um, this is the event with Rabbi Akiva occurs early in those 40 days, and he hasn't gotten everything yet. And right. That's what Rashi says. Right. Look, it's it's early in the time he will learn it. This right. is what 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 the uh, Gemara is really saying. Yeah. Okay. I mean, sure, we can take that simple approach. I think though that's not the way many use it over the generations. I, I think this Gemara is often used as a way of showing that there is sort of a, a great expansion of Torah after, after Moshe passes away. I mean, for example, we're going to see, I, I, maybe by the end, I'm, I, if we get to this at the very end, or Moshe Feinstein in his introduction to Igor Moshe, to his Shalos Atruvos, he uses this Gemara to talk about to talk about this idea 
about how much Torah has grown um, and, and how much every generation sort of has the ability to increase the amount of Torah by deriving new things. Um, so, 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 it's, so it's often used in this way. We're also going to see, I think, with Sadok HaKoyen of Lublin, who we're going to talk about again toward the end of the series, where he also relies on this Gemara to, to show that there was indeed a lot of development um, after, a, after Moshe. Um, perhaps, perhaps what this uh, Gemara is getting at is that really the author is God. The author is God. That's the author of the law it's being given through Moshe. He doesn't necessarily understand everything that's being given to him. And so not everything was necessarily understood at that time. But God, who is really beyond time, was given at Sinai. And so in some sense, Sinai is beyond time. And so even though we say it's me Sinai, it's beyond time. And, and it only becomes apparent to us over the course of time. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, but this, this Gemara also implies, I and mean, it's, it's a lot of interesting things, but it also implies that from, say, Yeshua's time when they forgot 3,000 uh, laws, whatever, to Rabbi Akiva's time, nobody could figure it out. And Rabbi Akiva is the only one who could understand the crowns on the Torah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it says. I mean, that's, that's what the later interpretation is saying. And mm -hmm. that's a little... Uh, Hard to, hard to buy into. Mm -hmm. You know what's also very interesting is I, I saw this once in an article and I haven't like looked into it thoroughly myself that apparently there are no, like the Gemara never talks about laws that are derived from crowns. Like there isn't actually any, any, any halacha that we have that's learned out from a crown, which is also interesting that sort of the, this Gemara focuses over here focuses so much on the idea that we are going to learn things from there, but then this is not a principle that's that's used anywhere else. Um, well, I think that, excuse me, I think that the, the use of the tagim in this mm -hmm. Gemara shows that it is metaphoric mm -hmm. because the tagim are a, a way later uh, invention. Mm -hmm. Tava Shuri comes much later. Right. The Torah exactly. wasn't yes. even yes. given with these things. Yes. Yes, so that, it's that's the whole thing. Is, it's a metaphor. Yeah, it's not that he could actually use them because the tagim are not divine. Right. Okay. You know that that that's a really important point. I do I do want to speak to that for just a moment. That that I, I think what it's often important to understand the Gemara often speaks metaphorically. That these stories are meant to teach us something, not necessarily be literal. And and in this case, for sure, like um, the even the process of the script in which the Torah was written has changed over time. Um, it, it does seem like that there was a different script initially at the time of Sinai. And then it, the, uh, the Ketav Ashuri, or the block letters that we use today in the Torah, and including sort of the way we write them with the crowns, um, th those letters themselves are, are Aramaic letters and, and from the time of Ezra. Um, and, and so we're talking already thousands of years later before, before even the script could have come into being. So yes, that, that's, that's certainly a good point. And this is indeed a really interesting discussion of this Gemara. I just want to go back and address a couple more points in the chat and then move on to our last topic in the share up um, as, as we're getting closer to the end here. Um, uh, Susanna mentions the concept of ongoing revelation. And yes, this is something we're going to talk about a little more later in the series. Um, Saul says, what principles are you talking about? I assume you're referring over here when I was talking about general principles that Moshe received, so it could be. It's hard to know in Shemot Rabbah, the Midrash that we saw exactly which principles we're talking about, but there is this idea of principles of interpretation of exegetical principles like the Yud Gimel Midot of Rabbi Ishmael, these 13 principles um, that, that we talked about of how to interpret the Torah. So that might be what we're talking about over here. Uh, the most important, Noah says the most important event of the Avon Machnai is the instance of learning about shame. Ima Shalom rebukes strongly after the more famous miracle episode about embarrassment. Yes, the, 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 the Gemara does continue there for a while. Uh, uh, the this, this story continues and there are other, other um, there, 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 are, there are other things that, that occur about Rabbi Eliezer and what happens to him. So yes, that's also, that's also true. Um, Dennis says, if halacha is the oral law, then it is the bridge between heaven and earth, a true echad between the spiritual and the material world. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Um, Ariel says, an early example of time travel, for sure. Gershon says, we're the uh, Shurot in Menachah, the last eight verses. Okay, so we discussed that about whether that's talking about after Moshe died. Um, Dr. Irene Lackenster says, Ibn Ezra, thought so. I guess I didn't see exactly when this comment was entered, so I'm, oh yes, the, the last eight verses, right. Yes, Ibn, Ibn Ezra thought for, yes, that Ibn Ezra 
talks about how maybe there were additional verses beyond the eight verses of the Torah that were written later. And he uses the eight verses that were the Gemara already says were written later as a proof that maybe there were additional verses um, that may also have been written later. But that's a whole other conversation. Um, okay, let me see. And he says, wouldn't the idea of Moshe being put at ease that Moshe sees generations later are still re referring to the fact that Moshe was in the law at Sinai? Yes. If I didn't mention that, I should have. Um, that, that, that Moshe sees that like he, um, he's still integral to the process of revelation. That even if things have changed a lot over time, um, everything still gets traced back to him. Yeah, thank you again for all these comments and discussion. And I want to conclude with one additional topic that's going to help set the a framework as well for, for later classes. Um, and later discussion of this issue. And that's topic number three on the source sheet, does Midrash create new law? Um, so all over the Mishnah and the Gemara, the Halach and Midrashim, Chazal disagree about how to interpret or darshan verses in the written Torah. And when they do darshan, they use various textual, textual cues or exegetical principles, just like the 13 Midot of Rabbi Ishmael that we just, we just talked about. Um, you know, and and the question is though, then what exactly are Chazal doing when they dash in the Pasuk? And I think there's two ways, two things they could possibly be doing. Is the Drasha creative? Are they actually using the Pasuk to create a new law that didn't exist before? Like, are they saying the fact that, you know, there's one word here and another word there, and we can apply the law in one context, the second context, are they saying that that principle itself allows us to sort of create a new law? We call that a Midrash Yotzer. Or are we saying that it's it's a midrash mikayim, meaning the law already existed via tradition, meaning the fact that you do X in one context and the same thing in the other context, that was already well known through tradition. And the fact that we can find a verse to support that, is that just like a scriptural support that you know supports a pre-existing, a pre-existing tradition tradition? Um, and, and 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 this is sort of a debate that that goes way back, basically. Do we say it's Midrash Yotzer, Midrash Mekayim? Do we say that the Drash would actually create new law or just provide a support to an existing oral tradition? Um, and I don't think there's any way to resolve this debate. Um, and it's almost certain that both kinds of Drashot exist in Chazal, but it's often very hard to tell which is which. And I want to just give a couple of examples um, where maybe one is more likely than the other. Um, source number 11. This is Mishnah and Brachot. It's also in the Haggadah that we read recently, um, so it should be familiar. Amar Rabbi Lezer ben Azaria, Harayni kevin shevim shana velo zachisi shetemri etsiyas etzvay malelos ad shedrasha ben zoma. I'm like a 70-year-old man. I have not married to understand why the exodus from Egypt should be set at night until ben zoma explained it. Shenamar, um, and he says, so how do we know that we say the exodus at night? And what he means by saying the exodus at night, we're talking about the third paragraph of Shema. The third paragraph of Shema that talks about Sitzis talks at the end about uh, the, um, you know, remembering leaving Egypt. Um, and, and he says, we have a pasuk that, um, that shows us that we're supposed to say um, the third paragraph of Shema at night. And the pasuk, he says, he uses his laman to his court, Yom Yom You should remember the day you left Egypt all the days of your life. So he says the words Yom Chayacha refer to the days. When it says kol, it adds all the days of your life. That means the nights as well. They use the words for a different purpose. They said it's not that Yom Chayacha teaches us day and kol Yom Chayacha teaches us night, but Yom Chayacha teaches us this world and kol Yom Chayacha teaches us about the days of Mashiach. So here we have. Um, ben Zoma using a pasuk to teach us that we're supposed to say Shema at night. So here's the question. When Ben Zoma is saying that, what, what exactly is going on? Was there already a tradition to say Shema at night and to mention Yisias Mitzrayim? And now we're just providing a scriptural support for that practice? Or actually, is this the source of it? Like, were they not saying um, Shema, the third paragraph at least of Shema at night until Ben Zoma explained it. Um, anyone have any quick thoughts on which one seems more likely in this instance? There was probably a uh, machloket about it, a Beit Shama, Beit Hillel kind of a thing. That's one idea. Okay. Uh, Rabbeni, Rabbeni Lau says that this entire conversation 
is an argument about whether you should talk about Yitzhak Mitzrayim at all on the Seder, on Pesach night, that the Zevach Pesach is all about just Makat Bechorot and not about Yitzhak Mitzrayim, whether, again, whether Yitzhak Mitzrayim started at night or only started in the morning. And so that's the crux of their argument. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, I don't want to talk so much about the Pesach context here, um, but because th this, uh, this is also a Mishnah in Brachot that it goes beyond Pesach. But but yeah, thank you for that. But I, I think probably, I think probably mm -hmm. they did not say Kriyat Shema at night until okay. that moment. Okay, yeah, yeah. Th that's right. what was the Chiddush. They, mm -hmm. they did say Kriyat Shema at night because they argue about the time uh, prior to this Mishnah. So. It's, okay. It's, what, what, what was it chronologically prior though when they argue about the time? I, I haven't. I haven't. I don't. I'm not 100 percent sure. It, it seems. It seems. It's chronicle. The the group arguing about it are are. I I think they're either a little before or contemporaneous to Benzoma. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. They, it, yeah. Rabban Gamliel is the one who says who tells his his son. Oh no! You have all night to say it. You can say Shema right. until the okay. next morning. Right, it was Rabban Gamliel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Okay. So let's look at source number twelve quickly. The Rambam, when he interprets this Mishnah, um, he says, um, he says, "V'amar be'inyan t'mia harayani alpha pishis shadal to bitchabardim anshe achachma." He says, "Behold, I am with astonishment. Even though I tried to, to get together with the men of wisdom, I did not merit to know the hint in the verse that hints regarding the obligation to say parshat sits at night until Ben Zoma expanded it." So the Ramba, the Rambam at least seems to be understanding that there was a pre-existing practice. I think, but I didn't know the hint in the pasuk for the practice. Um, so, so he at least seems to be saying that 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 this is an example of where there was a pre-existing tradition that people were doing one or the other, um, and then the the Benzoma's drasha just helped um, j just helped to firm that up, kind of um, to provide a, some kind of scriptural cue or support to it, um, but not but not maybe that they actually weren't doing it until this time. So that's one possible interpretation. But as people pointed out, there are probably other ways to read this as well. Um, Let's 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 look at one other example. Good question. The the if you if you if you learn Talmud, the the Talmud never uses the language. Now we're going to start. I'm sorry. I think the question cut off. But actually, I I, I let me just try to move on. Um, and and just just finish. The material and then, and then I can address your question as well. So th thank you for holding it for the time being. Um, so the, the other case I want to talk about and the last case I want to talk about is one where it seems at least that like the drasha um, that they is actually generating ge generating new law. Um, this is the Gemara in Sanhedrin and this is in source, sources 13 and 14 we're going to focus on. Uh, the Gemara discusses an instance where the daughter of a Kohen who committed adultery she is put to death by sreifa or burning instead of chenek strangulation. I know this is kind of a, a bit of a you know upsetting topic, but it, you know there's, there's a lot of discussion in the Gemara about various punishments um, for different offenses. Um, in general, sreifa or burning is considered a more severe type of death penalty. Um, so Rabbi Yishmael he says the stricter penalty of sreifa or burning is only when she is an arusa, which means when the first stage of marriage. Um, has been completed, when Kedushin has been completed, but not Nisuin, not the second stage of marriage. Rabbi Akiva disagrees, and he says that even when the marriage has been consummated, when she is a Nisua, she's also completed the second stage of marriage, um, that she still gets the stricter death penalty, Sreifa or burning, instead of the lower death penalty, which is Chenek or strangulation. And so the Gemara then dis explains um, th th their dispute. You can see first in the verse, um, source number 13, the puzzle, it talks about how she, um, um, that, that, that there is there is this uh, death penalty of of burning of sreifa, um, and then the Gemara then discusses when that when that particular punishment is applied. So Rabbi Akiva says, "Amar Rabbi Akiva." So Rabbi Akiva says to Rabbi Shmuel, "Yishmal Achi, Yishmal, my brother, but uvat ani doresh." I darsh in the fact that it doesn't say "bat ish kohen ki is note. It says "uvat." We have an extra vav. 
And so Rabbi Shmuel replies, Amrle Vichim of Nesha Ta Doresh Bat Ubat Notsi Zulus Refa. Um, because there's one extra vav, we're going to take this woman out for burning when otherwise she should get a lesser death penalty. So he says, that's really extreme. So it seems over here that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shmuel did not receive different traditions from their teachers that they were trying to support with the Torah verse. Rather, it seems they weren't sure what the right punishment was supposed to be. They didn't, it wasn't a pre-existing tradition. Um, and they actually used this laws of interpretation. One of them is willing to darshan the extra vav and one of them is not. To figure out to, to 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 figure out what's going on, um, to figure out what the punishment should be. So it seems, at least, that in this case, they're actually using the drasha to come up with a new law. Now, is there another way to read this? Possibly. It's possible you could still say that they had pre-existing traditions, but that Rabbi Akiva um, felt more secure in his tradition once he had the extra vav. And Rabbi Ishmael said, well, I'm not going to let an extra vav disturb my pre-existing tradition because an extra vav is not sufficient to do that. So I think it's still possible to read the other way, um, but I think this is an instance maybe where it's more likely that they're faced with a blank canvas and they're coming out with a new law based on the drasha. Um, and I think at this point, it should be pretty clear that we've seen a lot of different things about the way Chazal um, understand the origins of the Torah Shabbat. We've seen views that seem to say that maybe everything was given at Sinai. Maybe some things were telegraphed to Moshe, but not transmitted. Perhaps Moshe only learned principles of interpretation. And even when it comes to these principles of interpretation, do these principles of interpretation create new law or do they support pre-existing law? And I think these sources are all set us up for what we're gonna do in the later parts of the series, um, wh wh where we talk more in depth about how, for example, machloket or debate develops, which is what we're gonna devote um, the, our second class too. Yeah, so so thank you everyone for that. Um, and do we have another minute for me to address, I guess, uh, what's left in the chat and any other questions people have? Yep, for uh, sure. Just the point, can you please resend the, uh, the uh, reference to the sources? Mm -hmm. I, I joined late, so I need to uh, pick up the source list. Yeah, sure. Are you able to resend that? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, I just, if you want to take some questions, maybe you want to uh, take the share screen. Yes, down. let me do that. Thank you. I, I often forget to do that, so I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think there was maybe one one more comment in the chat that um, I saw. Let me just do that first. Um, Okay, Philip says, what exactly merits a new Lozachisi interpretation? I, I, I'm not sure about that particular phrase, Lozachisi, and like when it's used and when other phrases are used. Um, Janine points out, is it really a new law or is it building on other way to use an existing law or response to another need that is now acknowledged to be able to be dealt with with an existing law? The existing laws are, will be applicable to living on other plants. Okay, I mean, yeah, so it's a question, I mean, about um, whether these laws are pre-existing or, 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 or whether... Um, there are, are, are new applications for them. Okay. How do the patriarchs know of oral Torah before Sinai? Well, that's a whole other question. That's a whole other shear. Um, but but it's always possible, again, when Chazal talk about the patriarchs knowing it, um, they, they're they not meaning in a literal way, but they're trying to teach us something more, more metaphorically through that. Um, Ariel Siegel points out the difference between the first two paragraphs being a Torah obligation, the third being rabbinic when it comes to Shema. Um, and... Okay, yeah, so I think I've addressed the comments in the chat. Um, and now if anyone has any final questions before we close, I'm happy to entertain them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I, just, Thank you. I just posted a, uh, a, a comment, a question. Yeah, oh, okay, Ariel, I see your comment. This is about Rev. Elias and Rev. Steinsaltz and their dispute that we talked about uh, at the beginning. And there's some... Uh, um, yeah, are the Haredi authorities acknowledging the nuances um, in, in the presentation of how we understand Torah Shabbat Peh, or to what extent is perhaps a circling of the wagons? Yeah, I mean, sometimes in these pages, like something with the Jewish Observer or other magazines where people are trying to make points um, and, and sort of, you know, adhere to certain positions, they, they may not be fully discussing all the sources that may point in, in different directions that disagree 
with their point. I think it's also interesting that Rabbi Elias is, um, Rabbi Elias is part of the German Jewish community, is a strong follower, follower of Rav Hirsch from Germany. And we're going to talk about, in Shear number three, about Rav Hirsch's view. And as you will see, the Rav Hirsch's view is, is very traditional in this regard, to the, in the sense that he really believes very strongly in a lot being given at Sinai and not as much developing later. So Rabbi Elias may have been influenced by that as well. Is it possible to share your email with us? Sure, yeah. And yeah, feel free to write me questions. I will do that now. And you were going to share a link to the articles. As yes, well. yes. Let me do that as well. Sorry, just give me a second. Mm -hmm. Here's a link to the articles as well. That's the full PDF of all of all the articles I wrote on the topic on the site. You can also find them individually um, as HTML and not PDF if you prefer. Um, yeah, here's a link to, for example, to the first in the series. Okay, thank you again so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing everybody again next week. This was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Shavuot, thank you. everybody. Remember thank you. Now, remember Omer. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye, bye now.